any field of education that you see in ISKCON, she has touched it in some way or the other. Uh, we heard her contribution in philosophy of education. We've heard her contribution to the library. We've heard her contribution to the Sunday school. We've heard her contribution to the Gurukul. So that's Her Grace Urmila Mataji. Some of the things that I've noticed People not connecting with the real needs and concerns of the audience. Talking about something that nobody really cares about. Well, let's memorize all these Sanskrit terms from Madhurya Kadambani. Or not crafted to facilitate long-term retention. That was a great class. What do you remember? Uh, I don't know. It was about Krishna. Not crafted to facilitate application. What do you do with it? How do you use it? How do you implement it in your life? Not crafted to encourage devotees to be independently thoughtful. I have wrote, memorized these particular terms. Something that really bothers me, not based on the real life experience of the teachers. Nice story in Chaitanya Charitamrita about Sankaracharya debating with a king. And I suggest you look that up. You know, people who've never been married, giving long seminars on the Grahasta Ashram, people who've never had children or trained children, giving long seminars on how to raise children. So something where there's just no connection with the person's lived life experiences and what they're teaching. Duplication of effort. So you have all different people teaching something similar, and they're all creating their own curriculum from scratch, and sometimes substandard or inaccurate content. One of my friends was just complaining to me how she went to three classes at a temple that shall not be named, by a speaker who shall not be named, and the grossly inaccurate mistakes that were being given from the Vyasa son. So what's the result? The result is that attendance in most of our classes is not very high, unless the classes are required. You know, you've got to take Bhakti Shastri to get second initiated and so forth. You have to take the disciples' course. But otherwise, not that many people come. And more and more and more people are learning what they feel they need to know by going outside of ISKCON and, and outside of relationship to Krishna consciousness. Most of the youth raised in our society don't come to our movement for their education. They think it's boring. They think it's not practical. And we seem to have a mentality that our teachers don't need training in the craft of teaching. You just need to have bhakti. Just chant your 16 rounds, go to Mangalartik, follow the principles, and Krishna will send a ray of light to your heart, and you'll be an expert teacher. That's kind of the mood. You know, could we imagine saying to people, just go in the kitchen and chant Hare Krishna. And whatever you make will be lovely. Remember that Vidura offered the banana peels, and it was OK. So Top and Mishra Prabhu uh, actually kind of dragged me to do this particular seminar and this particular service. And so one of the things he asked me to do was to research something about what other religious institutions do as far as training their teachers. So we have a, a very short time, and uh, therefore I'm not able to present the details. But I did look up with, uh, with Mormons, I did look up with Muslims, with Buddhists, and there's many solid programs for teacher training. If you want the information, you can ask me uh, separately. So coming back to philosophy of education, what's our philosophy about what is our responsibility as teachers in terms of the craft of teaching? So here we refer to Srila Prabhupada. This is a class on Bhagavatam 7.12.6, given in Mumbai, April 17, 1976. And this is a series of classes that Srila Prabhupada gave on the section of the Bhagavatam that deals with Gurukula. Prabhupada relating Gurukula for children to the Brahmachari Ashram and the kind of education that we should give people growing up in Krishna consciousness. 
Okay, reading this quote. Not that he has become Krishna conscious and Vaishnava. He is unable to do anything of this material world. No. One who is Krishna conscious, he is conscious of everything and he knows how to deal with them. That is called daksha. Not that, quote, because I have become Krishna conscious, I have no knowledge in other things. No. Every. You must have, if not complete, to know something of everything. That is intelligence. To know something of everything and to know everything of something that is wanted. You may be expert, a devotee. You know everything of devotional service, but you should not be callous. You know something of everything that is called daksha. Prabhupada wanted the devotees to know something of everything and everything of something. And the something of which we're supposed to know everything is what service we do. If our service is teaching and preaching, we should know the craft of preaching. Huh? What do you think? Yeah? All right. So what are the causes of our expertise in any area? Well, one would be native inclination, probably from previous lives. The other would be our purity and our empowerment by the Lord. And the other is our deliberate study of the craft. So how are we going to do this? How are we going to create in ISKCON, just like we have the Deity Worship Academy, where people are learning how to put turbans on the deities with expertise. We have cooking academies, where people learn how to make cashew halva rather than avocado halva, and how to fry and bake eggplants rather than boil them with plantains. So in a similar way, we need a culture that if you're going to be a teacher and you're going to be a preacher, you should be expert in your craft. And in addition, we need systematic training. Now, we're doing that to some extent. We have the TTC1, TTC2, the Bhakti Shastri teachers training. We had for three years in Bhaktivedanta College a teacher training course. So we're doing that to some extent. But I would suggest that we need to look around and see who's doing expert training of teachers and preachers and start to replicate that. We need to start having a mood that those who teach and preach be expert in their craft, and we need to set up a training program. So Tapan Mishra Prabhu is very enthusiastic, and I've agreed to be the dog of a Vaishnava and help him out a little bit here, to set up a ministry program where we're going to teach people the craft of teaching. So to that end, We've been working for the last few weeks, so I wanted, told Tapan Mishra Prabhu that I wanted to show some of the videos that we've been producing. And he said, why? I said, because otherwise people get up here and say, we should do this, and we should do that, and we should do this, and we should do that. And everybody goes, yeah, right, whatever, nothing ever happens. So I'd like to actually show you that we've started to do this. It is just a start. Uh, so far, uh, I personally recorded... 11 short videos, and we got two of them edited, took till 9 o'clock last night. We hope to get the rest edited while I'm here in Mayapur. We've also got some submissions from other teachers in other parts of the world. Eventually, we want to have a whole course in the craft of teaching, and I believe that Tampa and Mr. Prabhu wants to have this as a certified course and start to require that people who teach and preach in ISKCON actually learn the craft of teaching. So what we're starting out with the course is something called instructional design. So that is not exactly how to teach, but it's how to plan your teaching. So I'm showing this to you just simply to prove to you that we're actually doing something. Yes, Seisha Prabhu knows, I always say, the ministry has to do something. Right? And also to invite you to get involved. What we've started here in Mayapur is just the beginning we're going to need dozens, if not hundreds, of short clips on all areas of education. We would like to invite all of you who are expert in your craft of teaching, and especially those of you who've trained teachers in teaching, to consider being part of this project and to make some recording in some small area. So we're going to show you right now, and I'm going to be very honest with you, the reason we're showing you these particular two clips is only and solely because they were the shortest. Seriously. It's not that they're the best or even that they're the most representative. They're just the shortest. And because of our time frame, that's what we're doing. So we're going to show you about a three-minute overview clip 
to go over the scope of what we're doing just right now, then about a five minute clip on finding resources, and then about four minutes of a video that we received from a devotee in Russia. He is the zonal, he's the regional Ministry of Education representative in Russia. All right? Everybody ready? And, and be kind. This is just, you know, this start attempt. Okay, roll them. Hi, Krishna. Welcome to our course in instructional design. We know that of the 26 qualities of the devotees, one of them is daksha, which means being expert in our service. Now, when our service is teaching, that expertise would include learning the skills and the crafts of teaching. I mean, certainly we need to have purity from good sadhana. We certainly need to avoid offenses. We need to study the Shastra. And we also need to understand the art and the craft of teaching. So just like Arjuna, you know, he spent so much time learning the art, the craft of fighting, how to use his weapons, how to hit the target, how to focus his attention. So in this course, we're going to be learning the art and craft of teaching, which is generally called instructional design. Now, in this course, we're not going to teach you how to teach, but how to plan teaching. So whether you're planning an hour course or a course that goes over many weeks and months, how are you going to plan that teaching? Now, what we invite you to do is to practice each session of the course after you've studied it. So study a section, put it into practice, then study a section and put it into practice. We're going to be gradually adding more lessons in each session. So what you see here is not the final form. We invite you to come back and see what we're going to be adding. We're also going to be adding interactivity and ways that you will get personal feedback. So what are the topics that we're going to cover in instructional design? The first one is how to identify the needs or the opportunities of the people that you're going to be teaching so that you can connect with your teaching to what need and opportunity is out there. The next is to find existing resources. What already exists that could help you with your teaching so you don't have to reinvent the wheel? The next is to clearly define your own aims, your own goals. Why are you teaching what you're teaching? What do you hope to accomplish? Then clearly defining what you want your students to learn, what you want them to accomplish by the end of your class or by the end of your course. Now, we also have a session on how to understand the nature and qualifications of your students or audience so you can tailor your teaching accordingly. We have a section on considering time in teaching. Also a section on resources. What resources do you need? What's available? How do you coordinate your plan with the resources? We have a section on identifying the irreducible minimum that your students will need to master in order to achieve success. We have a section on choosing appropriate teaching methods or also called learning experiences that will match everything else that we've been discussing. A section on making mastery of your material easy for your students. A section on assessing or evaluating how well your students have learned and some other wonderful sessions, such as the levels of learning and understanding according to Bloom. We wish you all success in becoming expert in your craft of teaching for the pleasure of Guru and Krishna. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. In our first lesson, we talked about finding the needs and opportunities and connecting what we want to teach to what people need to know. But suppose somebody else has already done something to meet those needs that we could use in our own teaching. So in this section, we're going to examine how can I find existing resources so I don't reinvent the wheel. 
I mean, after all, we have limited time, we have limited energy, we have limited resources. I mean, if I can find something that's already out there that I can use, why not do it? And maybe something that's already out there is really, really good. So how are we going to go about finding that? It's really a matter of making connections. Making connections to explore, is there something that already exists? Now, the first kind of connection I can make is with people who do a similar service. Other people who are teaching. If I'm teaching Bhagavad Gita, who else is teaching Bhagavad Gita? If I'm teaching about dealing with family relationships, somebody else teaching about dealing with family relationships. If I'm talking about how to be more efficient in a leadership position, is there somebody who's already teaching about that? Who's doing some services similar to mine that I could connect with and I could find out, hey, have you already produced a course like this? Or maybe you've done some lessons like this, or, or, or maybe you have something that I could use. Now, also there's connections with people in the same location who may not be doing the same kind of service but they may know of something. I mean, it's, it's interesting to me that often in our devotee communities that we don't ask other people in our locality, hey, do you know of something that could help me to meet this need of the people that I'm teaching? And they might know of something that we don't have access to at all. Then there's also connections specifically with people in different services. So, all right, if I want to teach about marital relationships, maybe there isn't somebody else who's teaching just about marital relationships. Maybe they're a traveling preacher who counsels people in marriages. Maybe they're the head of the kitchen and they end up dealing with people's marital situations. They're doing a different service, but they may know about resources that I can use. Then there's going out of my locations. And of course, we have the internet that we can connect with people, you know, very, very far away in very remote locations, but going beyond my community. And that's true even if our community is very large and very diverse. Looking, you know, maybe there's somebody else in another place who's already tried to do what I'm doing. Then going beyond ISKCON. Can we go, you know, other Gaudiya Vaishnavas, other Sampradayas? Maybe they have something already that exists that would I could use part of it. Or maybe I could use a big chunk of it. What's already out there for people who are really close to us in philosophy and practice? And then people who are not devotees at all, or not Hare Krishna devotees, maybe there's something that Muslims or Christians or Buddhists have done that would really be useful in what I'm trying to do. Or maybe people that are not religious at all, you know, maybe people who are teaching uh, on a similar topic in a, in a secular way, but they've got some excellent resource that I could pull into. And then in addition to my networking myself, find the network people. There are always people who have connections to dozens or hundreds or thousands of people. So, you know, you're looking for people in the same services, you're looking for people in the same location, different location, different services. But if you can find that person who, oh, yeah, I know who you can ask and I know where you can look and I know where you can do this. And they've already got those people connections. And then there are the people I call cosmic librarians. They can just find the resources. They may not be in connection with the people, but they know where there's that book, where there's that article, where there's that course, and they can often get it to you in just a moment. We can often be surprised at how much is already out there that's usable, that we don't necessarily have to spend hours and days and weeks and months creating new teaching resources from scratch. In fact, I've seen that just in ISKCON, There'll often be many, many people who are reinventing the wheel to teach the same course over and over and over again. Now, of course, you're going to want to customize your teaching for your style and the, the particular specific needs of your students, 
but why not see what's already out there before you start doing things yourself? Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, dear Vaishnavas, please accept my humble obeisances and all glories to Shah Prabhupada. My name is Tirtha Bhavanadas, I'm from Russia, and today we will be speaking about such an interesting concept as Bloom's taxonomy. Bloom, or Dr. Benjamin Bloom, is one of the persons who created different interesting concepts in modern education. I suppose many of you know that there are three divisions of knowledge, which are information, skills, and values, which are in scientific terms actually called cognitive, psychomotor, and affective areas of education. And those three were originally created or they were brought into education by Bloom. And in ISKCON, we speak a lot that we should not give to the devotees only information, but we should give them proper values and we should give them proper skills by which they would be able to practice and bring into life the values that they have. But is it all in all, is information, skills and values is the only thing we can know about these topics? In order to see that, let's read this interesting verse. It was brimming, and the sleepy toes did gar and gimble in the way. All mimsy were the borehoves, and the monographs outgrade. Now, it's a verse from which I suppose many of you didn't understand the meaning. But still, let's try to answer some of the questions. First one. What were the sleepy toes doing in the way? Now, many of you would be able to say that they guard and gimbal. How would you describe the state of the borogoves? They were mimsy. And what can you say about the mom raps? They outgrade. Now, without understanding the meaning, we can actually, by understanding the linguistics of English language be able to give approximate answers to those three questions. Now let's compare these three questions to the following three. Why were the borrowers missing? How effective was the mole graphs strategy? And how were mole graphs supposed to act in a bad way? I'm guessing you wouldn't be able to give answers to those three without understanding this verse. What can we see from this simple example? That there are questions and parts of understanding on which person can give answers without, without actually understanding something. He just can know the facts. But there are also deeper levels of understanding and to give answers to the questions from those spheres, the person is supposed to understand the topic better. Now, two questions for you. What consequences will be from the fact that the person knows something but doesn't understand it? Please stop the video and please do that sometimes during this lesson and just think a little bit about that. Another question I have for you is, would understanding be enough? Or well, there is something more to that? Maybe there are some deeper levels. Again, please stop the video and think for a little bit. Now, let's see this new concept called... So this is um, just a part of the offering that we have from this devotee in Russia, if those of you are familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, but here he's also giving some idea of, again, a skill in planning teaching so people don't just memorize information without understanding and don't even just stop at the understanding level, but go beyond. So I think these three clips give you just a little, little bit of an idea. You can turn this off. A little, little bit of an idea of the co online course that we're working on. And again, we're inviting anybody who would like to participate in this on any level, uh, please see Tapan Mishra or myself to, to volunteer for that. 
Thank you very much. And now we have questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna Mata. When you spoke of make, um, enabling teachers to develop skills so that they become perfect in their craft, how do you account for or how would you accommodate the fact that people have different personalities? Somebody might be very introverted, somebody might be aggressive and assertive. How do you account for this basic variety there is in human nature amongst the devotees and otherwise? What a beautiful question. Well, a large part of the craft of teaching is that what you're trying to do as a teacher is help each person you teach be the ideal form of themselves. That's what you're trying to do for your students, yes? That's our perfection. We're supposed to realize our eternal nature and use that in Krishna's service. And even in this world, our conditioned nature. So how am I going to do that for my students if I'm not doing that with myself? So each of us is going to become an ideal teacher in our own way. And something like talking about philosophy of education, you have a general philosophy of education, or we should, with which we all agree. And then each of us are going to personalize the details of that according to our individuality. So Krishna consciousness should make us more individual and more personal, not less so. So part of learning the craft of teaching is learning how to express that as myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a beautiful question. Thank Krishna you. Krishna Prabhu. Mataji, it's very uh, encouraging to see the tremendous work that you have done already and are continuing to do on the online platform. My question is, uh, you, you mentioned that you're specifically focusing on teacher uh, training for planning teaching. This particular section that we okay. started with. And then what about for delivery? And if, if our objective is to, through the online medium, able to certify and qualify people to take up at teaching courses, are we expecting some sort of on-site training to go along with this to certify their delivery expertise? I think that's a question for Tapan Mishra and Pancharatna. Okay. I think Krishna Prabhu, although we use the word certification here for this course, reaching a point of certification, we are several miles away from it as it stands. First is to provide this training to everybody. It will be available online for all the educators who are registered. Then we have to go and see how we're going to assess. Eventually, when we are all comfortable with the way we assess, can we say we'll reach a point where we'll start certifying teachers on curriculum design. So we are, want to get there, we're far away. You make a very relevant point. What we did was this. When we analyzed how best can we serve the educators community, we felt the lowest hanging fruit, which will have maximum impact today, is to teach them how to design the courses. That's step number one. And after that is progressively step number two. We have a team of devotees who are helping us produce that course, design that course. We have here His Grace Pancharatna Prabhu, uh, His Grace Mahatma Prabhu, His Grace Prana Prabhu, and also Janmashmi Prabhu, if he's present here. They're all working together with the ministry in producing that next course, which is going to complement this. And I must mention, these are trainings. They do not necessarily, online trainings do not necessarily always substitute completely what can be done on the ground. There will be some areas where some, that training must go on. So that's the plan, and that's currently under, underway. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And we just plan to have, you know, interactive and, and people giving feedback for the design portion of the course. But thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. I just have a, um, maybe a footnote uh, to, I like that you're using the word craft, the oh, craft of teaching. Thank you. And in particular, it reminds me of the fact that the word craft comes from the German, which means power in German. Oh. So it's actually about empowerment. When, when you are teaching the craft of teaching, you are empowering uh, the teachers. Thank you. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have one last time for one last question here. It's like that. She wants it in the evening. Hare Krishna Mataji. Thank you very much for the wonderful class. 
Uh, Mataji, I have one question. Um, it's regarding the youth. Because it's always a big challenge. So my first question is that, uh, what is your advice to approach to educate the youth? And second thing, how to sustain them? So because we have even the devotees of children who are living in ISKCON. Hare Krishna. I'm so glad you asked that question. I am just so glad you asked that question. Krishna is in everyone's heart. So it's not on the schedule, uh, but tonight at 6.30, after a video presentation from Radha Krishna Prabhu, we're going to be presenting the start of our uh, initiative to do curriculum in Krishna conscious training for children and youth. So what I'd like to ask, we just have uh, five printed copies of the sample. So what I'd like you all to do at lunchtime, if you could download this onto your electronic devices and take a look at it on the break. So this is the URL. If you could please just make a note of this right now. And then on the lunch break, if you could please download this onto your computer, tablet, phone, whatever. And at 6.30 tonight, uh, we just have uh, about a half an hour, yeah? Half an hour? Where we'll be going over that, that initiative, which again is something that's just starting, and seeing how you'd all like to get involved with that. So Krishna inspired you to ask that question just at that moment. Thank you very much.